Max Whittle at the NFL UK HQ. Delighted to say I'm joined by Chris Westling from the Around the NFL podcast. Chris, you've only been in London for a couple of days. You've already done a show on a boat and a live podcast. How are you feeling? Uh, I'm still adjusting to the jet lag. The time difference has been incredible, but uh, I feel great. And we've had such a good time that this is all a very pleasant experience. Now, many of you viewers out there that follow the NFL will know Chris was diagnosed last May with cancer. And if, if I may, first of all, ask you how you're, how you're feeling at the moment, Chris. I feel spectacular even. You know, when chemotherapy ended in January, and by March, I was feeling really well compared to where I was. You know, when you're going through chemotherapy, they're pumping this poison through your body. So, that, you know, you don't know how your body's going to react when it's over. And, um, you know, Lakeisha, my fiance, was confident all along. You'll feel great. We'll be able to do things again. And I wasn't confident at all. I thought, you know, I may. What percentage of my former self would I ever be again? And I honestly feel better now than I did before I was diagnosed. Um, losing a lot of weight helped. You know, it didn't help when I was 135 pounds, but now that I'm back to 170, I feel pretty healthy. Um, and and life has been good. I'm, I'm happy. That's great to hear. And if I may go back to last May, what is it like when a doctor tells you you've got cancer? Uh, it's a reality check. You, um, it, It's that unknowing because um, 48 hours was how long it took to hear I had cancer and then to find out if it had spread or not so in that 48 hours you don't know you know oh, do you only have a few months left to live or you know we, it's treatable we'll have surgery and we'll fix it so you just don't know and then you sort of it's a reality check in the sense that you could be facing the end and you have to deal with that um and luckily i made it through but you do have to sort of get your ducks in a row and deal with what um your life has been in the first couple of weeks after the diagnosis, how hard is it not to Google everything? It wasn't hard, and I thank Mark Sessler for that because he had been through a scare health-wise the year before, um, and he just told me, you know, the information on Google isn't reliable. You're not a doctor. You, you're not really qualified to interpret it. So Mark helped me in a big way with that, and um, just seeing things like my brother is Googling and then telling my mom, yeah, Chris is going to die because esophageal cancer is um, it's the worst cancer you can get. So um, I feel like that, that was all outdated information. And um, it, it helped me a lot just relying on my doctors and not Googling. Just put, your, put yourself in the hands of the experts. Who was the first person you told? Well, Lakeisha was there with me. And then after that, uh, I believe it was probably my mom, you know. Um, back in Cincinnati, I'm sure I called her and then then uh, texted the guys individually and basically said, um, let me know when you have a minute so I can call you. And then I told uh, the guys on the podcast, I called all of them one by one and told them. What was their reaction? If I mean, stunned, obviously. Stunned, um, almost to silence. But then, you know, each one was very supportive. You know, they were sort of gobsmacked and you know, silent for a little bit. But as soon as the conversation got going, they were all very supportive and, you know, what can they do to help? And we'll get through this. You know, that was sort of the, the response of all three of the uh, other guys on the show. When you were going through chemotherapy and the surgery, when you could, did you listen to around the NFL? Yeah, I think the way you phrase that question, that's good. Um, there were times where Either mentally or physically, I don't think I could listen to the show. Sometimes psychologically, I just, I don't think I was ready to always think about my job when I was going through it. So there were times where I didn't listen to it, but I would say I probably listened to 75 to 80% of the shows while I was while I was out. And what would go through your mind when you heard, I mean, the fourth hero is, is Chris Wessling and you are, an, you are a hero after what you've been through, but what did it feel like listening? Yeah, I would get... <laughs> I would get really miffed that Greg was taking control of the room, <laughs> that nobody was there to tell him to shut up and he's wrong. And, you know, I think Greg and I have that dynamic that, like, it's sort of like a brother. You know, when you grow up and you and your brother are always fighting and arguing, and it's sort of like that one-upsmanship, and you can't let the other guy have the upper hand. And as knowledgeable as Greg is about football, you know, he can – sort of exert his will over Mark and Dan at times when, when the topic is about football. And I just catch myself throwing things at the phone like, come on, you guys got to tell Greg he's full of it, you know? So I think that was, that was one of the main things that I remember while I was listening. 
And would you text them the, that after the show? Sometimes I would. I, I, I do remember one or two times where, I, you know, we do have this text, the four of us, you know, where we text every day, whatever's on our minds. And I remember a couple of times putting it out there. You're like, Greg, come on, you're full of it. I would have told you this or I would have told you that. Um, this doesn't have the same effect on text as it does on the podcast, obviously. But but yeah, we did, we did go over that. Chris, those are just Patriots fans. We know that, right? Um, <laughs> You're an avid reader as well, and you have this great list online that people can actually go and look at if you want a, uh, an NFL book inspiration. But was there a new book, football or not, that you really found useful while you were going through this? Yeah, there, there was a book called Sapiens, which um, written by a British guy, I believe, um, which seemed to be one of the most profound books I've read, uh, certainly in years. And that really it made me think a lot about life and uh, what came before us and what's coming next and then sort of our purpose in life. And then a football book, uh, you know what else? Um, seven Years in Tibet. I read that while I was going through chemotherapy and it really hit home for me. I've always loved travel writing. That one was good. And then a football book, One More July, written by Bill Curry, former Packers center. Um, I, a lot of people know Instant Replay, written by Jerry Kramer, a different former Green Bay Packer. But I think this One More July is better uh, because Bill Curry's so smart, and and there's a whole chapter like it starts out on Vince Lombardi and psychology that just really captured, I think as well as anything I've ever read, psychology and sports and how it works and um, what you have to go through to be part of a team. Um, there's sort of that um, military um, philosophy that that football has that you kind of band together and all for all for the team, you know, and I think that section really captures it well and other people in your industry i listened today to peter king's podcast with chris mortensen and you have sky sports very own jeff reinbold craig sager who he lost last year did you meet any of those on the way and speak to those guys I and mean, chris was was certainly at the forefront in the nfl yeah chris uh, i believe he reached out to me and and on twitter a couple of times and was supportive and um jeff reinbold i met him at the super bowl and we recorded a couple of minutes on, you know, our sort of journeys through cancer together. And he was as nice as can be. And I really enjoyed meeting Jeff. You were very open, very honest on social media. But was there a particular moment where you just thought this is this is not going where it should? There, there were several moments like that. But certainly the surgery was the hardest part that it was supposed to be a four hour procedure. It took nine hours. I was in the hospital for eight days. Um, I had to learn to walk again, had to learn to get out of bed again. Um, it was a very debilitating, you know, few weeks or month or, or even longer than that. You know, when I got out, I was on an oxygen tank and a walker. And, it, you know, you sort of feel like an infant or a very elderly person. Like, you can't really do anything for yourself. You're really vulnerable. And um, the just honestly, the pain of going through that, the physical pain uh, of the surgery itself was, was incredible. And then... And then it gets, the better you get physically, you're still like psychologically fragile and mentally, um, there's a lot of hurdles you have to get through. And I know that being alive is motivation number one, but did football have anything in your mind where you just fought a little bit harder to get back? That's a tough question. Certainly football was on, on my mind in, in the sense that I think when you go through something like that, you do think about what's your purpose in life, what are you living for, and through the podcast i think more more than football itself just that people around the world are waiting to hear what the four of us or the five of us when colleen's there have to say about football so in that sense you want to fight to get back and, and be on the show because people are like daily weekly whatever people are relying on you or want to hear what you have to say or the four of you together what you have to say about it so in that sense more than football itself i think Who's come up to you, even in this on this trip to London? What what have people said to you? You know, last night we had the live show, and we we talked for hours afterwards with a lot of the people who attended, or even people who just came to the uh, to the pub afterwards. And you know, I must have talked to a hundred or one hundred and fifty people, and more than half of them wanted to talk about cancer. That somebody in their lives, you know. My best friend was going through this. My grandpa was going through this. My dad was going through this. My sister was going through this. You know, and some of them didn't make it. And, you know, most of them did, thankfully. But to hear so many people say that it really helped me, and not just helped me, but their significant other who was going through the cancer was helped by the fact that I talked about it. 
and even the, the good things that can result from cancer, like that they got a lot out of the positivity that I would talk about, oh, like that support system and the love and, you know, being able to get through it. And it does, there is that feeling of being forged by fire, like you can become a better person. It's a fresh start. There's a new chapter in your life. And it is what you make of it. And I think a lot of people did get something out of that. What did you learn about cancer that you would pass on to people? Well, there's a few things I would start by saying, like when people talk about battling cancer or beating cancer, like none of that really checks out to me. Like you, you don't beat it. it. You sort of put your hands, put yourself in the hands of the experts and let them fight it for you. You're sort of along for the ride. And, and maybe I'm minimizing how much you have to fight because you do, but so much of it is just allowing the people who do this for a living to do what they do best and putting yourself in their hands, letting the drugs work because you're not beating cancer without drugs. Um, the medicine helps. So uh, that and I think at the end of the day, psychologically is still the hardest part for me. When, when I think about whether, whether people should donate to a cancer charity or a mental health charity, I almost side on the side of mental health because cancer puts you through the ringer like that mentally that you just kind of like afterwards you're just like what did i just go through and is my mind ever going to be the same again so finally chris and i appreciate you telling us all these things what are you going to do 2018 season that's a new chris wesling thing having gone through what you've gone through you know i think this is the time for the four of us and the time for me personally where we're probably transitioning more away from writing and into making sure the podcast can be as good as it can be. And I think that's probably foremost in my mind, just to make sure that we, we don't stay at the same level on the podcast, that we get even better, even though we're doing well and everybody's happy, that just to make sure that the podcast is forefront in our minds and keeps getting better and don't settle just because we have good chemistry. Don't rely on that. Keep watching the games, keep staying on top of it. And, um, Make sure that podcast gets, you know, I want to be the best football podcast. Hmm. I don't think that's too much to ask. Chris, I really appreciate your time talking about this today. Thank you. Thanks, Max. From Chris Wessling, I'm Max Whittle at the NFL UK office.